Thank you so much for inviting me here. Lisa, thank you for arranging everything. I can't tell you what a joy it is to be here because eight years ago, almost to the day, I went to a dinner party here um, at which I first heard the word Bodoni. I had never heard that word before. Somehow or other, I got really interested in, in the idea of writing a biography of somebody who lived in Italy. Um, <laughs> I happen to like Italy very much. And um, the, my host at the dinner party said, um, we really, really, really need a biography of Bodoni in English. There are biographies, there are in fact three biographies of him in Italian. Um, and two of them are 200 years old and one is 100 years old. So the, you know, things are slightly out of date. And um, so with that incentive, you know, the idea that it was needed, I love an underdog, a cause, and the idea of going to Italy. I thought, okay, this is, this is good. I can, I can deal with this. But of course, I had taken one semester of Italian when I was 17. Everything apart from one short article by Maitland, is in Italian or French. I speak French, that's fine, no problem. So I started from scratch, really. I started going to classes, you know, three times a week at the local community college, and kind of got myself up to scratch and set off, but it was here that it started, and here that I'm and David has, oh, uh, honest, honestly, I cannot tell you how delighted I am with the book. The production values are so fantastic, and um, I, I feel like crying, uh, but I won't. Okay, so, Bodoni. He was born in Saluzzo in Piemonte, which is northwestern Italy, in the foothills of the Alps, just to the west of Turin. He was the, oh, I've, look, and I've got a pointer, I can show you. So he was born, there's Turin. So he was born, these are the, the Alpmaritim. So he was born just about there. Um, and when he was nearly 18, not quite, he was still 17, he went to Rome, which is there. And then he spent his business life, the rest of his life, in Parma, which is there, slap in the middle of <laughs> north central Italy. This is his hometown. This is Saluzzo, which is in the shadow of this magnificent mountain, which is called Monviso. And it's on that mountain that three streams run down and form the Po River, which then proceeds from the west of Italy all the way across to the east, where it, it empties into the Adriatic. But this is, this is where he was born, so hilly and, and perfectly beautiful. That's the house in which he was born. And there is the um, plaque which tells you his dates and everything, and it is now a um, cleaning and um, dry cleaning and dyeing establishment. The plaque is interesting because it um, defies Wikipedia. It has the correct date of birth, which is February the 26th, not February the 16th. I've tried to change it, but I failed. I will try again. Okay, so February the 26th, 1742, born in this house. On the left, you see his grandfather, and on the right is his father. So um, look at the style of the one on the right and, and try to remember it, because I'll refer to it again. He, he grew up learning the trade along with his father. He turned out to be really good at cutting woodcuts, so he did, he did, um, he did little woodcuts, decorations for, for books, and he sold them in Turin, and then, uh, in spite of what David said about him, he's not terribly, terribly dull, he's only a little dull. He was <laughs> heavingly ambitious. I mean, he, he, 
at the, as I say, at the age of 17, he decided that he was going to go to Rome where he would become the greatest printer who ever lived. I mean, it was as simple as that. He went with a friend who was um, um, entering the priesthood, and the friend wanted to be the greatest, the greatest priest, uh, the greatest servant of God who ever lived. So they had something in common. This is the school in which Bodoni studied in Saluzzo. It's called, uh, the building is now a lovely museum. It's called the Casa Cavassa. And, but it was pretty darn cold, I think, there in the winter. I mean, there, there's not a whole lot of central heating there. So, as I mentioned, when he was nearly 18, he set off with this young friend for Rome and arriving there in 1758. He had trouble finding work and nearly lost hope, but eventually he found his way to the press of the Propaganda Fide. The Propaganda Fide was the missionary arm of the Vatican, actually still is the missionary arm of the Vatican, printing Bibles and missals in exotic languages, languages in, in the Middle East and the Far East, um, for people, you know, for the propagation of the faith. The Protestants, unfortunately, were making some headway, and they wanted to be able to propagate the faith, faith, faith in, in many, many languages. So that is where Bodoni worked. Um, it's a marvelous building. Um, uh, it's in the Piazza di Spagna, not far from the Spanish Steps. It is now no longer the headquarters of the press. That has moved, um, but it is a museum. And you go in there and you say, where did Bodoni, where, where was the press? And they have no idea. It's very disappointing. Uh, Bodoni was actually hired by Cardinal Spinelli, who took a great fancy to him. Bodoni was terrific at finding work and impressing um, priests and patrons and benefactors. Bodoni, uh, here again, he's quite interesting in that he, he, in his ability to make his own rather profitable way, should we say. So Cardinal Spinelli lived in the Palazzo Valentini, which is the building on the right here. So just imagine, Bodoni could roll out of bed in the morning and take a few steps, and he'd be at the base of Trajan's column and able to look at some lettering, right? Pretty famous lettering. He worked, he worked hard, and the, the powers that be at the press found that he was particularly adept with these exotic languages. The first job they gave him was to sort to sort, wait a minute, let me get this right. To sort type that had the, the, the press had owned for a long time, but that had got jumbled up. And so he was able to figure out which language was which, which and sort them into, into cases and organized everything. So they gave him a job of setting a pontificale, which is a book for bishops. And this on the left is the first edition, should we say, of it. This, this image, you are very privileged to see this image. It's very, very rare. It's at the Houghton Library at Harvard. I have never seen it anywhere else, and they'd never seen it in Parma when I, I showed it in Parma in February. <clears throat> but. The powers that be were so impressed by Bodoni's work that they allowed him for their second printing to put his name at the bottom. You'll see his name and the, his, his, his town um, at the bottom of that page. Now that, you can see that in, in the Bodoni Museum in Parma. I've seen it other places. But this one has very rare written on it in pencil at the Houghton Library in Harvard. At the um, Propaganda Fide Press, Bodoni met this um, Father Pachaudi, who was to have 
an influence on what happened to him later. But only after eight years in, in, um, in Rome, Cardinal Spinelli had died, his immediate um, boss, um, Costantino Ruggeri, had killed himself, very mysterious circumstances. And Bodoni was beginning to feel he needed to spread his wings. He admired the work of Baskerville, and he knew that there was a lot going on in the print world in England at that time. And he had some English friends, and they persuaded him that he should go, he should go to England. So he decided to set off, and he, he left Rome. But on the way to England, he fell ill with what one of his Italian biographers called, calls tertian fever, which we interpret to be malaria. So he had to call short his journey. It, it must have been a pretty severe ca case of malaria. malaria. He went home to mummy. And he stayed in, in Saluzzo for about a year and a half, working again with his father, recovering, and then um, once he was feeling better, making little trips to Turin and trying to stir up interest, when suddenly he got a letter from none other than the young Duke of Parma and his prime minister, Guillaume Dutillo. And this is where Father Pachaudi comes in. Father Pachaudi had left Rome and had become the, the well-beloved and entirely trustworthy librarian at, at Parma. And when, when Guillaume Dutillo and the, the young duke decided that Parma needed to put itself on the map, and how did you do that in those days? You, you had a press and they wanted to have a press that competed with Turin and with Paris, none other than Paris. They, they were very ambitious, but they didn't know who to ask to run the press. So they sought the advice of Pierre-Jean Mariette in Paris, <clears throat> because of course the, the, the prime minister was Frenchman and, and everything good came from France, right? Pierre-Jean Mariette was a, a connoisseur uh, collector and a very, very um, erudite man. And he, in his wisdom, said, do not use a Frenchman. Use an Italian who is used to the language that you will be print, that, that your um, printer will be using himself. And that was pretty good advice. So Father Pacciaudi remembered Bodoni remembered the work that Bodoni was doing, remembered Bodoni's competence. Bodoni had by then started cutting his own punches. So Pachaudi had a pretty good idea, and he recommended that Bodoni go to Parma, set up the press, and then run it and, and print. So Bodoni, 1768, he set off for Parma. And that great big building there is the Palazzo, Palazzo della Pilota. And on the front, on the lower level of that, was where Bodoni's studio was, just on the edge of the river. If the river was in flood, I heard that sometimes the, the little waves would come lapping into the print works. <laughs> From La Pilota, this, this bridge crossed over into the park, the Ducal Park, and the Duke's residence in Parma. So Bodoni was able to you know, um, print something and trot across the bridge and show it to the Duke. It was, they had a very close relationship, and um, yeah, it was pretty handy. Also, not far away, Bodoni, just a stone's throw away, maybe, I don't know, a thousand yards or something, but only could find himself in the center of town in this beautiful Piazza del Duomo, the cathedral square. And this is, this is um, an 11th century baptistry with, with wonderful frescoes and um, carvings of, of um, 
work that people did. And um, here's, the, here's one of the doors. Um, it's this lovely pink marble. And so here's one of the carvings. So what do you think the fellow on the left is doing? Any ideas? Remember, this is Palmer. Yes, yes, he's, he's, ma he's making sausages. He's making salami. Yes, yes. So there, there, there you have it. They were already doing that a long time ago. Palmer is also the city of Correggio, and there are wonderful, wonderful um, frescoes in, in, in the cathedral and in um, the, the, the church of St. John the Evangelist, which have these inspiring domes in which people are sent. This is the Virgin Mary. You don't often get to see her legs, do you? There she is, <laughs> ascending up into heaven. And I, I somehow can't help feeling that all this inspired Bodoni somehow or other. Inside the cathedral, this is the, um, the memorial plaque to him. It's huge. And down below is a plaque to his wife. And on the left, you have this, this um, tribute from the printers of the United States of America. And perhaps some of you are included in this. I don't know. That would be nice to think. Also, there is a, a wonderful convent, in the middle of which is a kind of secret chamber with this ceiling by Correggio. And Later on in Bodoni's life, he, he published a book of lithographs taken from this wonderful, mysterious room. I do hope that I'm inspiring you all to go to Parma, because it is a terrific small town that you can walk around with and see all these jewels. And also, you can, <laughs> you can eat rather well, if you, particularly if you like prosciutto and you like Parmesan cheese. But they, this is the local specialty, which is called Totelli d'Erbete. And it's, it's um, made with um, Swiss chard. It's quite good. Well, the Duke at 18, of course, when you're 18 and rather plump, you need a wife. And um, so it's this, the, the, a marriage was arranged. His wife was an Archduchess of Austria, five years older than he the eighth of the 16 children of Maria Theresa of Austria, and one of her younger sisters was Marie Antoinette, and she was a piece of work. <laughs> she brought in a lot of Austrianness to this very French court, and she loathed the French prime minister and was um, brought about his downfall. For the wedding, there was, um, I mean, it was a huge, a huge affair. And Bodoni was asked to work with the architect Petitot on a presentation volume, which remains to this day one of the greatest presentation volumes of all time. And you will see it. It's actually on the floor um, on the bottom left of the picture. And you will see it once again with Petitot. <laughs> There he has it on the, the top of the pillar to his right. Petito, I think, was quite amusing. Uh, more amusing than Bodoni, I think. <laughs> so this is the title page for this. this you know, it's one of these great big volumes. And it's highly illustrated. So there are all kinds of events in celebration of, of um, this wedding. There was a Chinese fair. There was an Arcadian idyll. And of course, you had to have fireworks. There were fireworks. And there were operas. And the operas were by Gluck. And the, the leading soprano was a, a, a young woman called Lucrezia Agujari. And she, um, she had a great admirer called Giuseppe Colla. Colla means glue in Italian. And Giuseppe Colla was such an admirer that he eventually married her. And um, he also helped her when she needed a little augmentation to one of her costumes. Oh. <laughs> 
Um, I actually have sound for this. I don't seem to have sound right now. If, um, and I have sound in other, in other slides, and I wonder if there's anyone who can help me bring the sound forth. No? Is there anyone here who could help me with this? I'm sorry, she sings for you. There's always something, isn't there? So. So Bodoni started work. He was by, by this time he was 28 years old, and um, he he didn't have much type. He brought a little bit with him from from um, Saluzzo, but he didn't have much type. So he was his greatest hero of all time was um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can play it down. See if you think you can play it down? Yeah? Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, Fournier, so he ordered type from Paris. And what happened was that he used Fournier's type, but as it broke down or wore out or whatever, he gradually, he was, by then he was cutting punches like mad. So he, he, he imitated Fournier at first, but gradually it became less Fournier and more Bodoni. It was a, it was a beautiful transition. So here, this is, uh, this is the one I feel is like his father's work. You, you're sort of reminiscent of his father's work. This is the first thing he printed, um, other than the, the big um, presentation volume, for... Um, for the, for, this is um, prayers and thanks for the recovery from malaria of the prime minister. He, he, um, this is very early work. 1771, he did his first specimen book of, of um, ornaments, very heavily based on Fournier, very heavily based on Fournier. There's one of the interior pages. And this is rather nice. This is also... The, the, um, the Houghton Library has Brooks collection. So we have them to thank for this. And so this is Bodoni's hand sketches. Look at the sixth one down on the left. You see the little faces? Well, I blew them up because I thought they were kind of, kind of charming. And then here is Sumner Stone's modern version of Bodoni ornaments. So you see how it's translated now in, onto our computers. Some punches. They have, they have thousands of them in the B Bodoni Museum. And, and you know, the, 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 you, can, you can hold them, you can take them out, hold this wonderful cold steel, matrices, molds, Bodoni's molds. Not Bodoni's press but a copy of what, what he would have used. Not Bodoni's ink ball, but <laughs> I kind of like this picture. And I learned that they used um, dog hair um, for, in the ink balls. Yep. They're, they're funny about dogs in Parma. They love them, they love them, but they put them to good use too. <laughs> this is not Bodoni's studio, but it's, it's, um, it's a contemporary picture. So uh, this, I imagine, is very much like what um, you would have seen had you been a visitor, one of many, many visitors to Bodoni's studio. His fame spread. He was like a rock star. Bodoni was invited to go to other cities. Milan invited him, um, Madrid, and he, he liked Palma. It was cozy, but he was ambitious. And when this man, <clears throat> Jose Nicola de Azara, de Azara, Spanish, um, he, he, um, he was determined that Bodoni leave Parma, stop printing silly sonnets, right, and little, little broadsheets for the Duke and unimportant things, and come to Rome where he, Athara, would set up a press for him, give him lodging, and he would print the classics. 
um, well. The reason he had become so entranced with, with Bodoni is that he had seen this epithalamia, which was a paean to the Prince of Piedmont and his, his bride, the uh, Princess of France, for their wedding. And what Bodoni had done was to create a volume in which every page had a different language, every page had a different city. So this is the page for Saluzzo, his birth town, cities in Italy, of course. And for some reason or other, he chose to print Armenian on the page for Saluzzo. But this book really impressed um, Azhara. 1791 was a really big year because this was the year in which Athara was putting the real pressure on him. The Duke heard about it. The Duke knew that because Bodoni by now was so famous, because people from courts all, all over Europe were coming to visit, they would go and see Bodoni before they went and saw the Duke. Um, people were buying Bodoni. Um, he realized that he couldn't afford to lose him. It would be really bad for Palmer. So he, he made a compromise, a really brilliant compromise. He said, I will give you your own press, your private press. You can print anything you want, so long as you stay and print what I want as well. So this was a good compromise. This was the first thing off his press, printed for Azara. And you can see, it's Bodoni in his prime. He's got it all there. He's got the perfect white, he's got the perfect black, he's got the balance, the shape. That's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful volume. Guess what? I still don't have music. Never mind. We can do without it. Um, as David mentioned, he was 51 when he suddenly decided to get married. He, um, he had terrible gout. He was feeling his age. His uncle in Rome kept writing to him and sending him telling him it's, it's really time to get married. Marry someone like your mother, you know, not too tall. Um, I, just, I love that. And um, his sisters would write, no, aren't you getting married yet? We knew. Um, but um, finally, a couple of years before 1791, he met this young woman who was actually 18 years younger than he, and she was, happened to be engaged to somebody else, but it didn't seem to stop him, and she was, you know, women sometimes are attracted to fame, and I think that she found that, she found it very, and he was charming, she, he was charming. Um, <laughs> so, so he, um, so he courted her, he wrote to her, he wrote lovely letters to her, and eventually she got rid of the other fiancé, and they were, they were married in this little church. And I have a, a wonderful rock wedding march to play for you here, which you're not hearing, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and, um, and they essentially lived happily ever after. She was a terrific wife for him. She was efficient. She spoke fluent French and Italian. She learned English so that she could write to his English customers, and um, she acted as his hostess, his nurse, and finally, in the end, his printer. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, but all was not well in 1791. He he had some assistants called Amoretti, two brothers and their nephew. And they, they worked very hard for him. And they felt, and in fact, I think they were cutting punches, although he never admitted it. And they felt he needed to pay more attention to them and give them some credit, and he felt that he didn't need to. So there was a big rift, and it was rather unpleasant. And we still haven't gotten 
to the bottom of this, but maybe one of you will. And also, he came, um, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. Come back. This, um, on the left, you see Amoretti, and on the right, you see uh, Bodoni. And I think you can tell the difference, can't you? It's all to do with balance and, and shape. He also came in from for, for some severe criticism from um, Dido, who, um, having published his own Aeneid, was able to scrutinize Bodoni's Aeneid with an eagle eye and managed to find a, actually a horrifying amount of typos in it. <laughs> So he, he, he wrote a, a terrifically critical letter saying, while the man is perfectly capable of printing, he's not capable of publishing a, a clean text. Um, and Bodoni, of course, was very hurt. He thought that somebody had sent a, 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 an early copy before it had been proofread, which may well be the case. But anyway, there was you know, bad feelings between uh, Bodoni and Dido. But he did have friends. And uh, he, he got his friends together for conversazioni. For, on Friday afternoons, they, he would stop cutting punches. He would stop printing and have his friends over. And you see him there on the left and sort of embosomed with his biographer, a um, young man who subsequently became his biographer. Above them is his manservant, Dal Nastro. In the middle are three friends whose names I could probably dig out for you, but uh, it's a bit of a hard dig at the moment. Um, on the top right is his foreman, Ziliani, and his wife with her guitar, who seems to be gazing rather longingly at the young man, Fernando Payer, <laughs> who is, um, he's a composer who actually wrote the wedding march for Napoleon's second wedding. But I, I, I think that's rather a, a, a lovely image of what happened on Friday afternoons. Um, Rosa Spina was the one artist that he would entrust with, with engravings. He didn't particularly like illustrated books, but he would allow Rosa Spina to, to um, engrave for him. His paper maker was um, Pietro Miliani from Fabriano. He ordered most of his paper from Fabriano, which, of course, you know, it's still in business. Come along. What's happened? Here we go. He had fans. <laughs> he, um, Benjamin Franklin wrote him a fan letter in which he said, oh, congratulations, you've done such a wonderful job. However, had it been me, I would have done such and such. You know, being a printer himself, printers like to get things straight. Um, he also printed... Um, this on the occasion of his becoming an Arcadian. Here, this is something, um, you know, he's very snobbish and he really was a social climber, as was his wife. And so it, it was with great pleasure that he finally became an Arcadian. And this is a, a thank you um, poster. So it's quite big, it's about this big. It's in the Providence Public Library and it's something I have seen nowhere else. The Providence Public Library has the Updike collection of uh, Bodoni's, um, and really some impressive matter there. It's a, it's a really wonderful place. I remember when I, I, I visited it, we were close to having the manuscript ready, and I called David and I said, oh, I found a treasure trove, stop the press! You know, essentially something like that. So, I, so I'm very pleased, and it's nice to see two color printing there. He finally, the city of Parma, even though he was Piemontese, even though he was not from Parma, they finally gave him a gold medal. And the Pope 
having been to Paris to crown Napoleon emperor, while he was in Paris, saw um, a volume, an Oratio Dominica, in which the, a young um, printer called Marcel at the um, uh, Imprimerie um, Imperiale had, um, had printed this volume with 150 different languages, the Lord's Prayer in 150 different languages. So the Pope, passing through Parma, went to see Bodoni, as everyone did, and said to Bodoni, Kaha, can you beat Marcel? Well, of course, Bodoni loved a challenge, and he did. 155 different languages. <laughs> so this is his Arabic. And this is his Syriac. Photos by Ginger. And this is the second page of the Chinese, along with, with the, the, the musical tones. And the interesting thing about the Chinese is that it's the only, um, it's the only uh, one that is woodcut. He did woodcuts for it. All the others are type, lead type. So here's Napoleon, after having been crowned emperor in the robes of the king of Italy. And he, he was getting a firmer and firmer grip on, on, on Italy, North Italy, and, and the Papal States. And um, Bodoni, who, as David said, we won't talk about his politics. His politics were simple. Whoever was in control was Bodoni's man. So he, he, he was shameless. He would work for anybody who paid him well. Anyway. He wanted to impress Napoleon, and in um, 18, he published his Iliad in 1808. Very, he was very, very careful with his proofreading, and he had a very, very skillful and careful editor, so it is very clean. Um, anyway, he, he wanted to present a copy of it to Napoleon, but Napoleon at that time was off fighting battles, so it wasn't until 1810 that he finally delivered the, um, or he, actually he was in bed with the gout, but the editor took it to, to um, Napoleon. And six months later, um, Bodoni was awarded a pension for life. So that was very nice. Unfortunately, uh, in 1802, the Duke died rather mysteriously. Um, I go into this quite carefully. Um, the, 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 there's always gossip when somebody dies suddenly. And usually, gossip in Italy runs to poison. <laughs> However, I actually don't think it was poison, but you know, it, it, in, in the church in which um, at least part of him is buried. Um, <laughs> it, it says he was, it was poison. But I, I, I don't think we, we need to go along with that. So then, of course, Napoleon, the French, get an even tighter grip on, on Parma. Um, Napoleon gets rid of, OK, this is the, the Duke, presumably fairly shortly before he died. He got, he was, he was always prone to being plump. He got, he got quite, he loved to eat. He really loved to eat. He loved to hunt, and um, he wasn't always hunting game. He was hunting shepherdesses and that kind of thing. Anyway, um, the Duchess continued to be a piece of work. She, she, she loved, she was, she was never happier than when she was on a, on a horse. She loved her grooms and her dogs. So after the death of the Duke, there was um, a, a, an administrator, a French administrator, put in charge of Palmer, who became, of course, a very good friend of Bodoni's. And um, they, in actual fact, were really good friends. Napoleon, right, having, having um, married um, his second wife, having ditched Josephine, he married yet another Archduchess of Austria, um, 18 years old, um, and he was 39 at the time, and 
Shortly thereafter, he got what he wanted, a son, um, who, um, uh, whom they referred to as the King of Rome. This picture, I took this photograph, I found it in a sort of back office in, in, in one of the, the um, galleries in, in, in Parma. It's so interesting what you can find if you spend enough time roaming around. So in, in honor of that birth, um, Bodoni produced yet another of these beautiful albums um, of, of um, praise for the, for the new baby. And Napoleon, once again, was so pleased, he made him a knight of the um, imperial order of the reunion. So you could then call him Sir Giambattista Bodoni, Cavaliere Giambattista Bodoni. Towards the end of Bodoni's life, once again, he found himself a lovely patron, um, Napoleon's son-in-law, Murat, also known as the hot dresser. As, <laughs> as you can tell, he has some rather nice green suede boots. Anyway, um, Murat wanted his son to have the very best, and the very best meant the French classics printed by Bodoni. So this is what Bodoni was working on right at the end of his life. And this, this particular title page gave him enormous pleasure. I wonder if you can figure out why. Well, the, the fact that he managed to get the words Boileau Despereo on one line, he had to cut the punches specially in order to do that. So that tells you the level of detail he, and care he was prepared to take. He died um, on the 30th of November, 1813. And what, what's not in this picture is a very nice, very tall bell tower. And in the, in, in the bell tower, there's a huge bell, which is only told for the death of somebody really, really regal, aristocratic, really, really important. But they told it for Bodoni. Um, and Bodoni was once again divided up. Part of him is in the cathedral, and part of him is in his parish church. Uh, Margarita Dallaglio was shattered by his death. She, she adored him. However, she had a very strong will and a strong sense of direction and what she should do. So she finished everything that was on that all the orders that Bodoni still had in hand. And then she set to work towards printing the Manuale Tipografico, the great masterwork. Bodoni had, had done, it was ready, but it wasn't assembled. It was in disorder. But he had had the sense to write his very long, extremely boring, to my mind, introduction. She wrote her own, which I find much more. But uh, it's interesting to, to serious people. I mean, uh, Bodoni's introduction, it's, it, it is interesting to serious people. Um, but I, I find hers more, uh, um, more interesting. She talks about the difficulties of putting this thing together, and um, but how she had, she had felt it was essentially her life's work. And um, this is uh, she announced his death um, in, in 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 two ways in in Italian on the right and in French on the left. And it's interesting. She says that he 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 was snatched away by a violent um, catarrhal illness, um, which seems to signify sinus infection, and his, his gout, his ter terrible gout. He was often in bed for three months at a time with his gout. Um, I think from reading the descriptions of what happened to him before death, it sounds awfully like pneumonia to me. So. 
Those are also in the Providence collection, um, the Updike collection in Providence. So she did, she got it together. It took her five years to pull the whole great Manuale together. And she dedicated it, of course, to Maria Luigia, who, who, Napoleon's wife, who by now was Duchess of Parma. When Napoleon was sent to St. Helena, by, what, what, what do you do with an ex-emperor's wife? Well, you make her the a Duchess of Parma, of course. So she's now the Duchess of Parma, and, and Mrs. Bodoni, of course, loved people in power, so she dedicated it to her. This is the biggest type in the, in, in the whole um, volume. This is a letter from uh, um, Margarita Bodoni, once again in the Providence Public Library, in which she, it's a letter to a, a Monsieur Durand of, of Metz in France. Uh, she says in it, I printed 250 copies and I'm selling them for 120 francs each, no discount. <laughs> Not like you, no discount. <laughs> Tough. So, for a long time, when, you know, when when I was working in Palmer, people were always saying, "How many copies did he print? What did it cost?" They, they didn't know, but in Providence, they knew. I just, I think it's just wonderful that, in fact, over here we have some really good stuff. Now, how how are you holding up? Are you okay? You can have have some more, a little bit more. This is the face behind the face. This is you know, my title is the face behind the face. So this is the face, but this is this first one is not the face. This picture, which is in the Glauco Lombardi Museum in Parma, is of what do you call it? Uomo incognito, I think. Um, for many years, for years and years, it was considered to be Bodoni, but then recently, in the last five years or so. The um, specialists in clothing said, wrong necktie, wrong cravat, not, can't be Bodoni, this is late, this is late 18th, late 18th century, and this is a young man. So Bodoni either didn't age or, or it's not Bodoni. So, however, it's very like Bodoni. This is Bodoni with the bright necktie, right? And um, this is, in fact, Margarita Bodoni's favorite painting of him. And if you go back to this one, you can see they, they really are quite alike. So even though it's not Bodoni, we can think that, that that's what he looked like as a young man. So these are just images I found of him in in various places. This wins the prize for silliness. <laughs> Magisterial. That's the, the um, engraving done from the, the one that Margarita liked so much. These are modern variations. Funny, isn't it, what people do? This is my favorite. I, I think, I feel it's very true to him. It's, he's, he's there casually in his nightcap or something, or his printer's cap. And this is a late one, too. A loose sketch. We don't know who it's by, but I think it's, I think it's probably a pretty good likeness. And this is in his hometown, in, in the main school in his hometown. And I think you'll, you'll see at the bottom what it says. The best. <laughs> OK, now I've got a little bit more. It's very silly. You pre prepared for silly? <laughs> yes? OK. This is where there would be music. There would be volare playing <laughs> if we had the music. 
So what do you do? What do you do when you know nothing about Bodoni, you know very little about printing, um, you network, and most of you know who this is, yes? Um, Fred and Barbara Volk put me in touch with Sumner Stone. And Sumner became a sort of mentor to me. He, 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 he saw me through. It, it, this was a difficult journey, and, and he was very, very helpful. And Sumner interned, you know how it goes, put me in touch with Stan Nelson, who is one of the last people in the world who can still cut a punch. And I think, I think it was also Sumner who put me in touch with James Mosley. Any of you know James Mosley, apart from David, right? Who is the great print historian, English print historian. Better than that, he has a wife who is an authority on Italian cuisine and wrote the Oxford Companion to Italian food. She's wonderful. She's a wonderful cook, too. So I had them sort of behind me, keeping me honest on history and on food. <laughs> then I went, finally went to Parma. This is, remember, eight years ago. Parma was not very Wi-Fi. And I, I only found two places in the city. One was the Tourist Information Bureau, and the other was the Steps of the Baptistry, where I could, I could get online. So what do you do when you get to Parma? Well, you, you once again, you network, and you meet interesting and glamorous people. Look, look at these wonderful people that I met. And then I went, of course, to the Bodoni Museum, where, as an independent scholar and a um, no university affiliation, I was regarded with the deepest of suspicion. <laughs> However, there was a young woman working in, in the Bodoni Museum, and she took to me. She was about a third of my age, and she... She and I became terrific friends, and she couldn't do enough for me, which, um, which also meant weekends, going out together and visiting the countryside, and, and it was terrific. I also met, um, this is a man called Corrado Mingardi, and he's, he's referred to as Luomo Squisito, the exquisite man, for his taste and his generosity, and he's a great Bodoni expert. This is the rear end of Franco Maria Ricci, the great <laughs> publisher, and mine. And um, we are looking for Bodoni material in, in one of his, his um, chess. So you also experience carnival if you're there at the right time, which is a very lovely thing. The small people at the bottom are the people. The big ones are the puppets. And then, if you're lucky, you experience an earthquake in a room that rattles enormously and you're alone. That was quite exciting. And then, also, if you're lucky, you have snow upon snow. Um, I've actually rarely been as cold as I've been in Parma. It's, it was um, much to my surprise. I went to Rome and... Um, sought out the propaganda fide press. I had a, um, a short, um, I was a visiting scholar at the American Academy, which is extremely grand, um, and um, I found absolutely terrifying, but I, I, I benefited all the same. Um, the Tiber flooded. And I worked, um, the archives from the um, Propaganda Fide were moved to grounds in the Vatican underground. And above, in the um, sports fields, there were, were young proto-priests from all over the world playing tennis. I thought, it's funny, isn't it? What, what goes on? This is the Vatican press. This is, this, 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 it's a, quite a change from Bodoni's day. Got a haircut? <laughs> decided that it was better to wear my hiking boots when climbing the seven hills of Rome than going around in anything like that. 
And then, finally, I found Via Giovanni Battista Bodoni, which is in a, a, um, a section of Rome called Testaccio. And there, there, there are several streets named after printers. Aldo Manuzio, Beniamino Franklin, um, and Bodoni. And there's also rather a nice wine bar where if you're futsal, uh, you can go in and it has <laughs> rather an interesting um, poster outside for it. So that, that's it, folks. That's it. Thank you. I, I've been told that there are books and cake, and that I probably should answer questions along with books and cake. Okay? <laughs> <laughs>